Hello. It's our very first episode of Journey to the Microcosmos. And to start, we thought some introductions were in order. I'm Hank Green. I make YouTube channels, including SciShow and Crash Course. And this is James. James is a scientist living in Europe who has what I think is the appropriate amount of enthusiasm for microscopic life, which is to say, a lot of it. James has active living colonies of microorganisms throughout his home, though, for clarity, we all do. He just has them intentionally. He keeps tardigrades fed and happy, gathers samples to search out new organisms for his collection, and even takes samples in from elsewhere. The organisms we will explore on this channel are going to be almost entirely aquatic. This makes them easier to care for and to observe. But in the world of the micro, aquatic environments might be tiny droplets of water in soil, on tree bark, or the thin film of water covering the moss in your backyard. Organisms featured on this channel will be collected everywhere from soils to ponds, from puddles to seas. These ecosystems are similar to any you might find in the macroscopic world in many ways. Tiny organisms converting light into energy, like plants. Tiny organisms eating those organisms, and other tiny organisms eating those organisms. Though on the African savanna, you will rarely see a zebra consume a tree whole and then allow it to continue photosynthesizing through its transparent belly in order to produce sustenance for them both. Also, you very rarely see a tree eat a zebra in our world. But as we will see, the microcosmos can be a bit strange at times. James keeps what are called cultures alive and thriving in his home. These cultures are whole ecosystems with many different species living alongside each other. One is a monoculture of harmless algae that we're living on blueberries from the supermarket. And we'll soon be getting samples from one of the last remaining untouched forests of Europe and from the permafrost of Siberia. While this channel is going to explore remarkable diversity, we think it's important to start out with the three main sorts of organisms you're going to see here. First, and most simple, the prokaryotes. Single-celled and lacking organelles, the ones you're most familiar with are bacteria. For hundreds of millions, maybe even billions of years, prokaryotes were the only life on our planet. And for clarity, the Earth is only four and a half billion years old. The main thing that distinguishes them from the eukaryotes is that they don't have membrane-bound interior structures like the nucleus or chloroplasts or mitochondria. But since they have been around for so long, prokaryotes are remarkable in their diversity. They can be huge or tiny, a magnificent variety of shapes and colors from green to red to purple. Some contain mysterious crystals in their cells. Some reproduce by being broken into pieces, a handy trait when there are lots of things biting at you. And some of them can really move with the aid of flagella, long fibrous proteins that extend through the cell wall and wiggle around. Some bacteria are the cheetahs of the microcosmos. They tend to be tiny. Bacteria aren't always easy to see, even at 600x magnification, though some can be comparatively huge. And that includes cyanobacteria, that around 2.5 billion years ago were the first organisms to evolve the ability to turn sunlight into chemical energy. That changed the game in a lot of ways. It was very good for many organisms, including, eventually, us, and very bad for many others. But that's a story for another day. By 1.7 billion years ago, the second sort of organism you can expect to see here arrived, the eukaryotes. Now, we don't want to sound mean to our prokaryote friends who are massively varied and complex and wonderful. But single-celled eukaryotes take it to another level. They tend to be much larger, and so we can get a better view of their beauty and abilities. Sometimes these organisms are even big enough for us to see without microscopes. 
Single-celled eukaryotes are often sometimes called protists, and we have to make the single-celled distinction here because there are also multi-celled eukaryotes, which include a lot of different organisms, including mushrooms and trees and jellyfish and you. But since single-celled eukaryotes only have one cell, they can't have different cells that do different things like we do. Instead, they have different areas of their cells specialize. They have sensory systems. They can feel mechanical stimuli and react to it to avoid predators. The red spot in this protist is an eye spot that has light-sensing structures beneath it. They can hunt actively or can avoid being eaten. They can build shells for themselves and form colonies. Some even show simple learning behaviors. The complexity of these single-celled organisms sometimes makes you feel that they have a consciousness, and we're not here to say that they don't. Some of the eukaryotes we show are going to be photosynthetic, like diatoms, which, on their own, generate 20 to 50 percent of the oxygen produced on Earth and have cell walls made of glass. The best guess we have for how eukaryotic cells formed is that a single-celled prokaryote ate another prokaryote and then found that life was better for both of them if they survived together. Even today, the mitochondria in our bodies hold their own separate DNA, a relic of that ancient event. And finally, the third category of organism we'll be seeing a lot of on this channel, the microanimals. These are multi-celled eukaryotes, just like you and me. Animals like hydra, which can theoretically live forever, tardigrades that can survive the vacuum of space, rotifers that have thousands of cells with specialized muscles, intestines, even brains, kinda. So they are, in many ways, like us. But they also have some traits that sound otherworldly. Tardigrades are hatched with the exact same number of cells in their body that they will always have, and these tiny baby water bears then only grow as their cells grow bigger. And yet, these animals are so small that sometimes a single-celled organism can swallow them whole. Sorry, little rotifer. It's important to note that one cell can be a thousand times smaller than another cell, so a rotifer can have thousands of cells, but still be dwarfed by one protist. Because different magnifications are better for observing different organisms, we will always have the magnification on screen, whether that's 10x, 100x, or as much as a thousand times magnification. So. Prokaryotes, the simplest organisms you will see here, no organelles, but still massively varied. Single-celled eukaryotes, or protists, more varied, more specialized. And microanimals, with thousands or even tens of thousands of individual cells. Those are the three main categories of the kinds of organisms you can expect to see here. If you want to see more from our master of microscopes, James Weiss, check out Jams Germs on Instagram. And if you want to see more from us, that, my friends, is what that subscribe button is for. Thank you for coming on this journey with us as we explore the unseen world that surrounds us. When you peer into the microcosmos, it's sometimes hard to see past the cells themselves, flitting around, fighting, surviving, movement and shapes and colors. But we can see deeper, and there's so much more to see if you look beyond that first level and into the cell itself. In the cytoplasm, mysteries and curiosities abound. Here in our macro world, to see inside an organism, we need expensive scans or exploratory surgeries. In the microcosmos, we can just turn on the light 
and see some of the bizarre and beautiful systems that these organisms have for increasing their chances of surviving a harsh and uncertain world. So let's take a look at some of the structures inside of cells that you may have never heard of and that we love to let blow our minds. This is the unicellular alga clostarium. And at the very tips of these cells, an alluring little object. You see that orb with the tiny round things inside? Well, those are actually crystals made of barium and calcium sulfate. But why are they there? Well, no one knows yet, and we hope. Nay, we know someone will someday solve this mystery. But for now, it is yet another thing that we do not know about our universe. These crystals are extremely small, around two to three microns across. If you divided a millimeter into 500 equal pieces, one of those pieces is how big those little grains are. But there's more. You see how those crystals jiggle around and never stop moving, even though nothing seems to be moving them? Well, one thing we know about the universe is that things don't just move. The energy has to be coming from somewhere. Let's remember that everything you're looking at here is made of atoms. And when two hydrogen atoms and one oxygen atom come together, they form a water molecule. Now, Clostarium lives in water, which means it's surrounded by and filled with water molecules. And they are in constant motion. That's what heat is, the movement of atoms and molecules. If they weren't moving at all, that would be absolute zero, negative 273.15 degrees Celsius. That's not where we're at. These water molecules are moving around a lot and they're bumping into everything and they can even move objects around. If something's really big, like a whole Clostarium cell, you can't actually see any movement. But since these crystals are so tiny, the water molecules visibly toss them around. This dancing is called Brownian motion, and we love it because we, of course, cannot see water molecules under the microscope, but we can observe their effect on these crystals. Indeed, Albert Einstein used Brownian motion to confirm that atoms and molecules exist, which in 1905, when he published his paper on the subject, was still a matter of debate. And now we're watching it happen, watching water molecules smashing around into crystals that as yet remain unexplained, but must have some reason to exist, besides being fun for us to look at. This is Nasula ornata, a beautiful unicellular ciliate. Although it doesn't look like it right now, they can move quite fast. What you are looking at is a squashed Nasula ornata. We decided to give it a bit of a squeeze so we could take a real good look. When Nasula ornata hunts for food, it prefers filamentous cyanobacteria or algae. It wraps its membrane around it, forming a food vacuole. As it continues to eat, it forms more and more of these vacuoles. Now, what's so nice about them are their colors. Cyanobacteria and algae, Nasula's food, are green. But when Nasula starts dumping digestive enzymes into these food vacuoles, a chemical reaction occurs, changing the color of the food vacuole over time. Because different vacuoles are at different stages of digestion, each vacuole is a slightly different color, giving the ciliate its beautiful colored polka dots. These are the very long, very skinny cells of the filamentous sulfur bacteria Begiatoa. You can find them all over the globe, living in habitats from marine caves to sulfur springs to everyday ponds and rivers. When we find them, 
They're usually on freshwater pond sediments or decomposing organic material. Begiatoa excretes mucus, which allows them to glide around on the sediments. Begiatoa prefers sulfur-rich environments because they oxidize hydrogen sulfide as an energy source. The hydrogen is used by the organism in chemical synthesis, and the sulfur is left over. Every one of those tiny black dots that you see is a granule of inorganic sulfur. Here's another clip where you can look at them a bit closer under 1,000 times magnification, which, for the moment, is about as good as we can do here. Now, what's happening here? These little bubbles forming and popping. Well, they're not bubbles of air. They're bubbles of pure water. One of the most fundamental structures for life as a freshwater, single-celled organism is the contractile vacuole. This organelle allows unicellular organisms to pump excess water from their cell. Why? Well, inside of every cell, there are a lot of dissolved substances, more than the surrounding water contains, certainly. Whenever there's an imbalance like this, things tend toward equilibrium. And the only thing separating these cells from the water around them is a membrane that allows some, but not all, substances to pass through it passively. One of those substances is water. When the concentration of stuff inside the cell is higher than the concentration of stuff outside, water diffuses into the cell. There is no way to stop this diffusion. The solution to this constant influx of water is the contractile vacuole. This organelle fights a continuous battle, pumping and pumping and pumping the water out. Imagine, though, if the contractile vacuole was not working. You might think that eventually the cell would fill with so much water that the cellular machinery might break down. Well, maybe, except before that happened, the cell would expand so much that its membrane would break and it would literally explode. So, you know, good job, little vacuole. The ciliate luxodis is a common resident of different aquatic habitats, but they prefer a distinct zone in the water, a Goldilocks zone for oxygen. They like the concentration to be not too high and not too low. And in a body of water, unless something weird is going on, the oxygen concentration is higher at the top and lower toward the bottom. Because of its specific oxygen concentration preference, Loxodus needs to know which way is up and which way is down so it can find just the right spot. But how could a single-celled organism know up from down? Well, Loxodus can sense gravity. It has organelles called Muller vesicles that each contain a spherical mineral granule, the Muller body, attached to a hair-like cilium. Sorry these friends zip around so quick, it can be hard to get a good look. These granules, the Muller bodies, are actually pulled down by gravity, and it's believed that this pulling causes sensory signals to be transmitted to the cell through the cilium. So Loxodus, despite being tiny and despite being just a single cell, has an organ very much like our inner ear, allowing it to sense up from down. So yes, microbes display quite the collection of intracellular structures, only a few of which we discussed here. Some shiny, some colorful, and some that provide fascinating advanced capabilities. And it makes us wonder what other structures are yet to be discovered. There is so much that we do not know. We hope to report back to you on this question because we are sure that there are many more out there just waiting to be unveiled by a discerning eye peering into the microcosmos.
If you want to see more from our master of microscopes, James, check out Jam and Germs on Instagram. And if you want to see more from us here at Journey to the Microcosmos, I bet there's a subscribe button somewhere nearby. We didn't want to start this channel out with a video about tardigrades. We wanted to share at least a bit about some of the other mind-blowing organisms of the microcosmos first. But we also knew it wasn't going to be long before we got to them. We are, it must be admitted, tardigrade enthusiasts. And we've been excited to watch as a fair number of people have joined us in that enthusiasm. However, of course, and we're not mad about this, the popular narratives about tardigrades have, in their enthusiasm, gotten a few things less than correct, and also skipped over some of the most interesting facets of this celebrity of the microcosmos. So, tardigrades. They're chubby, and they have heads and legs and butts, and they look, at first glance, somewhat familiar. That's why we sometimes call them water bears, or even better, in our opinion, moss piglets, because they are often in the aquatic environments that cling to mosses. But they are also very unlike macro animals. For one thing, they have eight legs. For another thing, they are not closely related to anything else on Earth. Though taxonomists are still fighting about this, the leading system places tardigrades inside of a clade called Tactopoda that includes two groups. There's tardigrades, and there's something called Euarthropoda. And that other clade includes basically every bug insects, arachnids, even crustaceans and trilobites, the organism that branched away from tardigrades has literally millions of species as its ancestor, but the branch that tardigrades sit on, just tardigrades. Though there are over a thousand described tardigrade species, and there are likely many times more than that out there. But nonetheless, they do look a lot like bears with their claws and stumpy four pairs of legs. Tardigrades hover right on the edge of microscopic. They range widely in size from 50 microns long to 1200 microns, but usually they're under 500 microns in size. Tardigrades can be found in three major aquatic environments. Some live in marine or brackish water, others in fresh waters like ponds, lakes, and rivers. And then there are the terrestrial habitats. But this isn't exactly what it sounds like. See, tardigrades do live on what we would consider land, but they live in films of water clinging to plants and dirt. This thin film, though nearly invisible to us, can be a tardigrade's whole world. But these films can easily dry up in the daytime, which is part of why tardigrades are so good at surviving difficult situations, which of course we will be discussing shortly. They occupy almost every place on Earth, from the Arctic to the Antarctic, from soil to beach sand, rivers, lakes, streams, on mosses, lichens, algae, and plants. We know of a couple of places where we can almost certainly find them waddling around in samples we take, and we will make a whole episode about that process, but that's for later. Although they are aquatic, Tardigrades don't swim, they kind of walk, 
In fresh water, they live among vegetation and mainly feed on the cell contents of plants and algae by piercing the cells with the two stylets they have in their mouth part. But some species eat single-celled organisms or even other microanimals, including rotifers, and also other tardigrades. Some species of tardigrades have eyes, besides helping them look super cute. They also boggle the mind because they aren't eyes. To be an eye, you have to be an organ. And to be an organ, you have to be composed of tissues that are themselves composed of cells. But each tardigrade eye is, in fact, a single photoreceptive cell. That is wild. On their whole body, sometimes containing tens of thousands of cells, they have two cells. And those two cells are their two little eyes. Tardigrades are also covered in a kind of skin or shell called a cuticle. Coloration is produced by the pigmentation of the cuticle and also the content of the digestive tract. Gray, bluish, yellow, brown, reddish, or brown are all common colors. This cuticle always stays the same size, and so it must be shed as the tardigrade grows. Some species of tardigrades lay their eggs into this cuticle, which expands to hold them, and then, when the cuticle is shed, the eggs stay inside, giving them an extra layer of protection from roving predators. If those eggs manage to avoid being eaten, they will hatch into tiny little tardigradelets that, oddly enough, have the same number of cells that they will always have but their cells, and thus their bodies, will grow larger. Tardigrades are marvelously complex for such tiny animals. They have digestive systems and salivary glands, even small brains. The most complex have over 40,000 cells, and yes, when they are done extracting nutrients from their food, they have to get rid of it, just like the rest of us. Of course, tardigrades are best known for their survival skills. Many species have the ability to survive environmental extremes, such as temperatures as low as negative 272 degrees Celsius and as high as 150 degrees Celsius. Extreme radiation, extreme pressures as high as 6,000 atmospheres. NASA sent a bunch of tardigrades to outer space and brought them back alive after exposing the animals to the vacuum of space and extreme radiation from the sun. A tardigrade may have a lifespan of a couple of weeks to more than 100 years. A museum specimen of a dried moss that was in a herbarium for 120 years yielded active tardigrades when soaked in water. Tardigrades are able to survive these extremely hostile conditions by undergoing a process known as cryptobiosis. In cryptobiosis, the metabolism of the tardigrades can lower to less than 0.01% of normal. And when conditions get better, the tardigrades simply get back to life. There are actually several kinds of cryptobiosis. In anhydrobiosis, tardigrades are dealing with a lack of water, and they curl up into a ball called a ton to survive being all dried up. A glass-like protective sugar, trehalose, is synthesized, and it replaces the water in the cells of the tardigrades. This sugar prevents crucial parts of the cells from getting damaged during water loss, and it lets tardigrades survive the dry period. An oxybiosis occurs when there's insufficient oxygen. The body of the tardigrade swells and become rigid and turgid. There's no movement and the tardigrade looks dead. This sometimes happens in our prepared slides. So when it happens, we simply blow air into the slide from the side for around 10 seconds 
and that is enough to increase the oxygen concentration and revive the water bear. And there are other types of cryptobiosis, such as cryobiosis, where tardigrades can withstand extremely low temperatures, and osmobiosis, where they can withstand changes in osmotic pressure. One of the misconceptions about tardigrades is that they are immortal. They are resistant to these extreme conditions when they are in tun state, but otherwise, they're actually quite delicate animals and can be hurt and killed easily. Because of their small size, tardigrades are eaten by some even bigger single-celled organisms. In this video, we managed to record a close encounter between a tardigrade and a giant eukaryote. We don't even know what this single-celled organism here is. Let us know if you think you can identify it. But it could easily eat the tardigrade and digest it. But this lucky little one managed to escape, and even damaged the cell of the eukaryote in the process. And in this clip, we have a happy tardigrade waddling on one of the most dangerous residents of the ponds, a brown hydra. Hydra's tentacles are armed with something called nematocysts. These are like tiny harpoons that are fired upon contact to immobilize the hydra's prey. This water bear was either very lucky or too small to activate the nematocysts and so got away from a heartbreaking end. Tardigrades are not extremophiles. They do not enjoy living in extreme conditions. They're just good at surviving them. In that way, maybe they are something like us. We also sometimes live through situations we thought would be impossible to survive. But all things being equal, both tardigrades and us just want a nice place to live, plenty of yummy food, and whenever possible, to not be exposed to the vacuum of space. We are so happy that these friends share their world with us, so often just outside of our notice, but successfully chomping their way through the microcosmos for more than half a billion years. And just in case you wanted to see it again. <laughs> That's good. Thank you for coming on this journey with us through the unseen world that surrounds us. If you want to see more from our master of microscopes, James, check out Jam and Germs on Instagram. And if you want to see more from us here at Journey to the Microcosmos, I bet there's a subscribe button somewhere nearby. We really appreciate everybody's kind words in the comments. It really is just a joy to make this channel. Despite huge differences in morphology and biological structures, all living organisms do the same three basic things. They get food, digest it, and excrete waste materials. Living organisms require energy to live. Some produce their own food, usually through photosynthesis. We call these autotrophs. But many organisms cannot make their own food. We call these heterotrophs, and they eat. Among heterotrophic single-celled eukaryotes, food is taken into the cell in various methods, but once it's there, it's wrapped by a membrane and forms something called a food vacuole. Then the cell flushes digestive enzymes inside the food vacuole to start the digestion. Nutrients are taken into the cytoplasm, and the waste material left in the vacuole then basically fuses with the outer membrane of the cell, and what's left in the vacuole is discharged into the environment. In some cases, like inside this beautiful single-celled Nasula ornata, which feeds on filamentous cyanobacteria, content of the food vacuole reacts with the digestive enzymes and changes color. But that process takes time. 
because each vacuole formed at a different time, they are in different stages of digestion, which gives this cell its colorful polka dots. But how do these heterotrophic organisms get their food? Well, in spite of a remarkable amount of diversity, a lot of microorganisms use one of the same three strategies for getting their food. Some of this will be familiar to the macro world, some of it will not. One of the less familiar is filter feeding, which allows larger organisms to consume suspended food particles or much smaller organisms. There are filter feeders in the macro world, baleen whales come to mind. But while a whale must swim through giant clouds of small organisms in the microcosmos, your food can come to you. Some filter feeders use hair-like structures called cilia to create a vortex that brings other microorganisms or food particles to the cell mouth. These cilia are specialized for this task, and their beating creates a current that expediently and beautifully directs every nearby thing into the waiting mouth of the microorganism. The cilia are often too small for us to see, but you can see their effects. Take a look at these paramecia. They're consuming tiny, tiny bacteria, and you can see their cilia causing small organisms to tumble across them. You can also see all of their food vacuoles on the inside, and if you look very carefully, you can see a new food vacuole forming and getting filled up with those tiny bacterial cells. Some of the best and most obvious filter feeders are rotifers, microanimals that use cilia to create swirling vortices around their mouth parts. You can see how successful this feeding strategy is by its belly full of algae cells. Every time its mouth fills with more algae, it contracts to swallow the food. Now observe these single-celled organisms called stenters. They are much bigger than most other microorganisms. You can actually see them with the naked eye. And they also use filter feeding to push all of their algal food into their cell mouths. Our second feeding mechanism, maybe the most familiar and the most exciting, is called raptorial feeding. Raptorial feeders selectively capture prey and hunt other organisms. In this video, you can see Deleptus hunting. It paralyzes one organism with a touch of its trunk-like proboscis, and then it pulls that organism into itself in a process called phagocytosis. Many of these microorganisms are armed with something called toxicists. These are little harpoon-like structures filled with toxins, and they're located on a particular part of the cell, which the microorganism uses for hunting. These tiny harpoons are then fired when they come in contact with prey organisms, which then become immobilized. This is Bursaria. It's a single-celled organism with a huge mouth, and things have not gone well for the paramecium that is now inside it. The paramecium dies immediately because of the toxicists on the inside of the Bursaria. So at least it was quick. Now get ready for some truly gorgeous footage of a microanimal's day going south. First, Paradeleptus immobilizes the rotifer with fired toxicists, and the animal is swallowed by the single-celled organism as it swims away. This is Frontonia, which is a close relative of Paramecia, but it lacks the filter-feeding habits of its relatives and feeds predaciously on large diatoms and filamentous cyanobacteria, such as Oscillatoria here. Though in this case, it turns out this Frontonia bit off a little more than he could chew. 
Another raptorial feeding style is called histophagy. Histophagous organisms, such as these single-celled coleps, attack injured but live animals or other single-celled organisms, sucking off hunks of tissue rather than consuming whole organisms. When they attack an animal, they enter wounds and ingest tissue, often attacking in groups because their chemical sensing abilities attract many of them from a distance, like microscopic vultures. When a number of them gather in one place, it's hard to avoid another macro-world analog, piranhas, devouring everything soft in no time at all. There's a huge variety of raptorial feeding. This is just the beginning. But we wanted to show you one more before we move on. This is Vampirella, an amoeba with a suitable name. It specializes in feeding on filamentous algae. First, it bores a hole through the algal cell wall and then slurps out the gooey, nutritious cytoplasm. Our final feeding mechanism, for today at least, is diffusion feeding, in which the predator just sits in the same place, relying on the prey to accidentally make contact. This is a heliozoa. It's a single-celled amoeboid, and because of its resemblance to the sun due to the rays coming out of its cell, it's sometimes called the sun animalcule. The rays are called axipodia, these are sometimes used in locomotion, and in this case, for hunting prey. Axipodia are cytoplasmic extensions, meaning they're a part of the cell membrane, even though they look like they're sticking out of it. Each one has a central supporting rod of microtubules that gives it this rigid structure. The axipodia are coated in organelles that discharge toxins when touched, which impair or even paralyze Heliozoa's prey. After the organism is captured, those microtubules are drawn back into the cell, thus retracting the axipodia and allowing the cell to swallow the unlucky organism. Or, prey is just engulfed by extrusions from the cell called pseudopodia. In this video, a rotifer has been captured by a heliozoa and is slowly getting eaten by it. Now this is something that happens fairly frequently, but we did capture something unusual here. While it was stuck to heliozoa's axipodia, this rotifer actually lays its egg. But neither egg nor the rotifer is going to escape this. Surprisingly heartbreaking. This is a suctorian. It's a ciliate, just like paramecium and stentor. These organisms have hair-like cilia during the early stage of their life, but as adults, they develop bundles of tentacles. Just like in Heliozoa, these tentacles are supported by an internal cylinder of microtubules. The tip of the tentacles have extrusomes. These are special structures that attach to and immobilize any other ciliates that touch them. The tentacles eventually penetrate the cell membrane of the prey, and then the contents of the prey is sucked out through the tentacle. In this clip, a suctorian has caught four individual vorticella with its tentacles and is slowly sucking their cytoplasm. It looks a little like the vorticella have the suctorians surrounded, but in fact, they are powerless to escape it. It's a dangerous world out there. The complex chemicals created by organisms to sustain their life necessarily are useful to other organisms as building blocks and as fuel. And so predation evolved. It's beautiful, it's constant, and it's brutal. Thank you for watching and for coming on this journey with us as we explore the unseen world that surrounds us. If you want to see more from our master of microscopes, James, check out Jam's Germs on Instagram. And if you want to see more from us, that, my friends, is what the subscribe button is for.
death is inevitable, at least for the individual. Whether you're getting consumed or your environment poisons you or you fall apart as time marches on, we die. But our genes, fellow traveler, our genes often survive because we living things, we reproduce. And while humans, with our experience of plants and animals, are of course most familiar with sexual reproduction as we do it, that is absolutely not the only way it can be done. By this point on your journey, you should already know that nothing is usual in the microcosmos. Most unicellular reproduction is asexual, meaning one organism on its own can reproduce itself. The most common form of asexual reproduction, and the one you are most likely to know about in the microcosmos, is binary fission. One organism simply divides into two. Unicellular organisms, of course, do not have genders, but by custom, the dividing cell is called the mother, while the cells formed after division are called daughters. This is a heliozoa, an amoeboid cell with stiff arms called axipodia radiating from its spherical body. Here, it undergoes binary fission to create two daughter cells. Watch as these two future daughters move in opposing directions with the help of axipodia until the cytoplasmic bridge that was formed between them is finally cut off. Now, which of these two cells is the original and which is the offspring? In the microcosmos, that's not always how it works. Both of these heliozoa are daughters, and the mother has ceased existing. Either that or the mother is now both of them. And if that is the case, every single-celled organism is itself the same organism that has continued surviving since the very first cell reproduced itself billions of years ago. But, like, we don't want to hurt your brain too early in the episode, so it's probably best not to think about it too much. The process of binary fission happens fairly quickly, all things considered. But of course, we have to speed up the tape a bit for you to enjoy it. Here, a photosynthetic flagellate called Euglenodeses is dividing. The nucleus, however, has already divided, and each of these halves has its own control center, even though the cytoplasm is still joined, which makes you wonder, are these two separate organisms now, or are they only individuals once their membranes separate? Now, we're pretty sure this organism is Cyphodaria, but it's a little hard to be sure, especially during the reproduction process. But it is definitely some kind of testate amoeba, which are amoeba that build cells for themselves to live in that protect them from predators and just the world, which can be a rough place. You might think that they, like snails or clams, build these shells around themselves after they're born. And that is true for some testate amoebas, but not for this one. During cell division, Cyphodaria actually builds a second shell and then squirts new cell material into that shell to create its daughters. Ciliates, like Paramecium and Stentor, actually have two types of nuclei, a macronucleus and a micronucleus. The macronucleus controls the non-reproductive cell functions like eating, movement, and digestion, and the micronucleus is necessary for reproduction. These nuclei actually divide differently during reproduction, and for certain ciliates, the micronucleus plays a truly bizarre role. But to talk about that, we need to move away from asexual reproduction. 
which so far is all we've talked about, and it's fine, we guess. But in all of these cases, each daughter cell is a clone of the mother. In sexual reproduction, genes can flow much more easily through populations, which has a huge evolutionary advantage. But sexual reproduction in the microcosmos is not like sexual reproduction for the rest of us. Conjugation requires two cells. First, two ciliates become attached to each other by their oral surface. Micronuclei in the ciliates then divide several times in each cell. And then, one micronucleus from each cell moves into the other cell and fuses with the micronucleus there. The macronuclei of both cells then dissolves into the cytoplasm. Each cell now has a brand new genome. It is as if you gave someone a kiss and walked away a genetically different person. There are no children. The gene transfer happens to the existing organism. Now, after separation, the cells produce new micro and macro nuclei and then reproduce asexually until each daughter cell has the correct number of macro and micro nuclei for their species. Conjugation is thus considered a sexual phenomenon, which is immediately followed by repeated asexual reproduction. This can be hard to get your brain around because to us, the exchange of genetic information is so deeply tied with the creation of new offspring. But in the microcosmos, you can see, genetic exchange is possible without reproduction. If I were to tell you that this is only the very surface of the iceberg of complexity of reproduction in the microcosmos, I hope that by this point you would believe me, because it is. These beautiful bags of chemicals have to continue existing, and they have done so elegantly, using strategies that to us might seem counterintuitive, but are nevertheless the simplest and most effective ways for keeping their genes alive. And it's hard to fault them for it. It's been working for them for billions of years, while you and I, fellow traveler, have only been here for a blink. So thank you for coming on this journey with us as we explore the unseen world that surrounds us. If you want to see more from our master of microscopes, James, check out Jam and Germs on Instagram. And if you want to see more from us, there's always a subscribe button somewhere nearby. Life on Earth emerged at least three and a half billion years ago as prokaryotes. These are the simple unicellular organisms. They have a membrane on the outside and a wash of cellular machinery inside, all mixed together and touching and sharing the same environment. Now, this worked, certainly. Life chugged along this way for nearly half of the history of life on Earth. But then, 1.8 billion years ago, something remarkable happened. Something that led to a tremendous shift in the scope and complexity of life. Something we should all be grateful for, because without that leap, we would not exist. Cells started to contain cells. And this isn't generally how it's talked about in science class. There you hear that eukaryotes have, quote, membrane-bound 
organelles. These are areas of the cell that are separated from the rest of the cytoplasm by membranes, just as the cell itself is separated from the rest of the universe by its membrane. It turns out, different activities require different conditions, and these cells within cells allow for those different conditions. That, in short, is the secret of eukaryotic success. But how did it happen? Well, over decades of study, we've determined something shockingly peculiar, something so odd that it makes us kind of mad that we now discuss it as if it isn't the miracle it is. 1.8 billion years ago, a cell consumed another cell. But then it didn't digest it. It let it reproduce inside of it. And they lived together and over time became the same organism. Or did they? This is what we call endosymbiotic theory. Mitochondrion appeared when the consumed cell was adapted to live in an oxygen-rich environment, and chloroplasts appeared when the swallowed cell was photosynthetic. This idea was deeply controversial when it was first proposed, but as data have continued to come in, endosymbiotic theory has been able to explain more and more about the realities we find. For example, that chloroplasts have their own DNA, which they use to create the proteins required for their function. And as we dive deeper into the microcosmos, it just becomes obvious that this happens. This is Paramecium bursaria, a single-celled protozoa that has several hundred algal cells from the genus Chlorella living in its own cytoplasm, making it green. The algae live inside Paramecium bursaria, providing it with fuel in the form of sugar and other substances produced via photosynthesis. And Paramecium bursaria provides protection for the algae from algae eaters and viruses. P. bursaria is regarded as a predatory protozoa. It feeds on bacteria, small organisms, and yes, algae. And because of that, it's often thought that the algae in it are temporary symbionts engulfed by Paramecium bursaria's feeding behavior. But in fact, many other protozoa acquire algae in that manner for temporary use, but that is not the case for P. bursaria. Its symbionts are continuously inherited from generation to generation through cell division. The symbiotic chlorella guide the paramecium to well-lit areas so they can photosynthesize more efficiently. And the mutual relationship is extremely beneficial for the paramecium. Even when chlorella-containing paramecium cells are put in a nutrition-free saline solution, they could survive for more than three months while cells that didn't have chlorella died within a week. This is another single-celled organism with endosymbiotic algae. It's a testate amoeba, a kind of amoeba that builds itself a shell. This species, like some kind of sculptural artist, pulls bits and pieces of mineral from its environment to create these amazing-looking homes. You can see the amoeba extending from the opening of the shell, and you can see the green algae in its cytoplasm. Just like Paramecium bursaria, the algae use sunlight to produce food, sharing it with the amoeba, while the amoeba provides protection. Some unicellular organisms don't need oxygen for growth. Indeed, the presence of free oxygen can affect them negatively or even kill them. These organisms are known as anaerobes, such as this one, Metopus. It's an anaerobic ciliate we find in pond sediment, and it has an endosymbiotic relationship with methanogenic archaea. Now, we haven't talked much on this channel about archaeans, but they are the third domain of life, along with bacteria and eukaryotes. And like bacteria, they are prokaryotic. Can't wait to do our episode on them someday soon. 
Many of the single-celled eukaryotes living in anaerobic environments contain symbiotic prokaryotes. Some of these prokaryotes are methanogens, meaning they can use free hydrogen to generate energy and methane. The advantages of having these symbionts are not fully understood, but while Metopus can live without the symbionts, they grow faster when they have them. Endosymbiosis occurs in multicellular organisms as well. This is a freshwater relative of jellyfish and sea anemones, Hydra. It's simply stuffed full of algal symbionts. We collected this Hydra from a nearby pond and cultured it in our aquarium. The benefits provided by the symbiotic relationship here have been well documented, with scientists actually tracking how carbon moves from the environment into the algae and then into the hydra. And studies have shown that up to 69% of the caloric requirements of the hydra is satisfied by its algal symbionts. Nice. So we see some organisms temporarily pull in symbionts, others pass them from generation to generation. Some can survive without them, and some cannot. When we look at the algal cells in P. bursaria, we're forced to ask if those cells are part of the organism, or if they're simply cells of one species living in the cells of another. If that's the case, it's worth asking whether the mitochondria in you are you at all, or if they are just another extremely successful species of prokaryote that is particularly reliant on its host cell. As we look deeper and deeper down, the line between organisms is harder and harder to find, which is why, if you think hard enough, you might begin to feel like our cells are more than just ourselves. Thank you for coming on this journey with us as we explore the unseen world that surrounds and inhabits us. Journey to the Microcosmos is produced by Complexly, which produces over a dozen shows on YouTube, including SciShow. And we wanted to let you know that the SciShow team has just put out a really interesting new episode. This year, of course, marks the 50th anniversary of the first time humans walked on the moon. And to celebrate, SciShow made their first documentary. The team traveled throughout the U.S. I even went to the U.K. to talk to experts trying to figure out whether the moon landing was actually a good idea. And they got some really interesting answers, but I won't spoil them. You can watch the episode at youtube.com slash scishow or by clicking that link in the description. If you want to see more from our master of microscopes, James, check out Jam and Germs on Instagram. And if you want to see more from us, that, my friends, is what that subscribe button is for. Now, this is a guess, because I wasn't there, and we don't have any clear records of this period of history, but at some point in the early history of life on Earth, it's very likely nothing could move. Cells existed where they were, they got sloshed around through physical processes, and survived when they ended up by chance in some place that had the necessary chemicals for them to continue their lives and reproduce. If that didn't happen, they just died. But since food is never evenly distributed on our world, and also sometimes you are food, being able to move is fantastic. And so it has been selected for pretty intensely so that now, in the microcosmos, almost everything moves. But before we get to how they do it, we have to confront a reality. You need to forget everything you know about swimming. 
things do not work the same when you are tiny. You and I are constantly moving through a fluid. It's just hard to feel it. Air. It's barely there until you stick your hand out of a car window on the highway. Then you feel that fluid. But for a tiny grain of pollen, air is a thick fluid that can keep it airborne for days. Now sink that tiny grain of pollen into far more viscous water, and it's basically in a sticky glue. Imagine being completely submerged in honey, and you have a vague idea of what it's like swimming in the microcosmos. Which is why, in that microscopic world, when something stops moving, it just stops. You and I, if we push through the water, will coast for a bit as our momentum carries us forward. But for a single cell, the viscosity of the water overcomes that inertia instantly. This can lead to organisms looking as if they're moving somewhat unnaturally to our eyes, which is, we think, why we've had several people ask us if our footage is sped up. But no, unless it says so on screen, all of our clips are in real time. These little folks can just move. And they need to move to search for food, to avoid predators, to get into or out of sunlight, to move toward chemicals they need or away from chemicals that poison them. And the wild thing is, with all the diversity of microscopic life, single-celled eukaryotes basically all move around in three or maybe four different ways. How organisms move is so important and so obvious when they're observed that protozoans, which is the general name for single-celled eukaryotes, are actually loosely classified by their style of movement. We've got ciliates, which move using cilia, flagellates, which move using flagella, and amoeboids, which move using pseudopodia. Oh, and then there's sporozoa, which we cannot show you a picture of for reasons that will become clear. Sporozoa almost never move, and when they do, it's in a very weird, limited way. And the reason we can't show you a picture of one is that they are, every one of them, parasites. Many of them live inside of and cause disease in animals, so we choose to you know, not keep them around. But overall, among eukaryotes, we've got cilia, flagella, and pseudopodia. And we're going to start with the shapeshifters of the microcosmos, amoeba. These cells can change their shape as they wish, allowing them to extend parts of themselves into features called pseudopodia. These extend in the direction they want to move and then solidify as the cell moves into the newly occupied space. Pseudopodia is Latin for basically false feet, and these extensions, which are half reaching arm, half cell body, are how these crawlers move and hunt. The secret here is that the cytoplasm of an amoeba can be easily changed from a fluid state into a solid state and back again. When an amoeba moves, liquid cytoplasm flows through the center up to the tip of the pseudopod and then gushes to the sides, where it becomes more of a solid gel, allowing the cell to lock into its new location. Predatory amoeba create these extensions in all directions to trap prey between them. Once the prey organism is surrounded by the pseudopodia, the amoeba simply swallows it. The two other main mechanisms of eukaryotic movement, cilia and flagella, are more common, and they're actually really similar, both functionally and structurally at the molecular level. Though they look like rods sticking through the surface, they're actually extensions of the cell membrane wrapped around rigid tubes called microtubules that are anchored in place. However, hydrodynamically, they're very different. They're usually an easily countable number of flagella per cell, whereas ciliated organisms have huge numbers of cilia. The word cilia actually comes from the Latin word for eyelash, which makes sense as you can sometimes see them ringing a cell as our eyelashes ring our eyes. 
But in those cases, the cilia actually often cover the entire cell. They're just harder to spot against the background of all the stuff on the inside. Cilia move organisms by beating in waves over their surface. A cilium, which is the singular of cilia because Latin, has only two possible positions. During the effective stroke, the cilium sticks out perpendicular to the cell, and during recovery, it folds back towards the cell's surface. In most ciliates, the cilia are arranged in rows, and the cilia of a row don't move all together at once. When some of the cilia are in the effective stroke, others are in the recovery stroke. And in some ciliates, you can see the wave pattern this creates. And these waves are basically grabbing on to the sticky, viscous water, yanking the cell through. One added complication here, some ciliates have dense bundles of cilia called cirri. Cirri are used to walk on a solid substrate rather than pulling the organism through the water. Though it's the same structure, it is a bit of a different system of movement. Now, on to eukaryotic flagella. The motion of most flagella is characterized by this long, wave-like beating pattern beginning from the base of the flagella and moving out to the tip. This is Facus longicauda. We recorded this footage in phase contrast, which makes the transparent parts of the cell more visible so you can see the beating flagellum better. Can you see it at the tip of the cell? Facus longicauda is a photosynthetic flagellate. It uses sunlight to produce sugar. You can see the chloroplasts in the cell like green peas, and the round transparent part in the middle of the cell is a starch-like carbohydrate storage unit called paramylon. Now, of course, as always, the deeper you look, the more confusing and amazing things get. Diatoms are sometimes completely non-modal, but some species can also move by excreting mucus through their cell, slowly propelling them over a substrate. And finally, we said nothing in this entire video about the marvelous movements of prokaryotes, like bacteria. And they have systems every bit, if not more ingenious, than their more complex eukaryotic friends but they are also tiny. So tiny that these structures can't be observed by microscopes like the ones we use. So we just have to be content knowing that they use structures that function similarly to the structures eukaryotes use, but that are made of completely different stuff. And all of these chemical structures, eukaryotic and prokaryotic, so complex and marvelous, were selected for through billions of years of evolution. And almost shockingly, just a few extremely effective systems of locomotion were uncovered. The result? We can watch them. These little balls of chemicals working to get what they need. They are each a little soup that wants. Look at them wanting. Thank you for coming on this journey with us as we explore the unseen world that surrounds us. If you want to see more from our Master of Microscopes, James, check out Jam and Germs on Instagram. And if you want more from us, we've got a few videos over at youtube.com slash microcosmos, and we put out a new one every week. We've been doing a pretty good job of keeping on top of it. So thanks for liking what we do. In 1703, an anonymous Englishman, known to history only as Mr. C, wrote to the Royal Society of London to report on a peculiar observation he'd made using only a simple microscope. He'd been looking at the roots of pondweed, 
But as he looked closer, he found attached to the roots, quote, many pretty branches composed of rectangular oblongs and exact squares. At first, he assumed that these geometric attachments must be salt crystals, but the more he experimented and looked through his microscope, the more he realized there might be something amazing going on here. These tiny, beautiful shapes seemed kind of plant-like. Today, with the benefit of many, many more observations and far superior equipment, we know that this 18th century letter is one of the earliest descriptions of a diatom, a photosynthetic unicellular algae that can become so plentiful that oceanic blooms of these organisms, which we cannot see individually without a microscope, are nonetheless visible from space. But we wouldn't be talking about diatoms if we needed to be in space to observe them. You can find these tiny organisms just about anywhere that has water and light. Looking at them through a microscope, you might understand why microbe hunters are so fond of them. They have been called the jewels of the sea. Those beautiful outer shells are called frustules, and they set diatoms apart from every other living creature. Unlike the organic cell walls and membranes we associate with most cells, frustules are made out of inorganic silica, enclosing the cytoplasm of the diatom in what is basically glass. Silica shells take less energy to make and maintain compared to their organic counterparts, but they do come with a trade-off. Glass is, well, it's glass. It's hard to expand if you're a unicellular organism trying to undergo asexual mitosis when your cell is enclosed in a rigid, inorganic material. Instead, when diatoms divide, the daughter cells take the old frustule and divide it between them, which means that the daughter cells are both going to be smaller than their parent, and they are never going to grow any bigger. And as diatoms keep dividing, the daughter cells keep getting smaller and smaller. If this goes on forever, the diatom will get so small that it cannot survive. But diatoms that are starting to get too small can avoid that fate through sexual reproduction, which is a kind of refresh button that lets them construct a new frustule for a larger daughter cell. For the most part, diatoms can't actually move. They just go wherever the water takes them. But some diatoms are able to glide along a surface using a slit in their frustule called a rafe. This allows them to secrete mucus that sticks to a surface. But how does that mucus help them move? We don't know. We can see that they move, so they must be able to. And we can see that mucus is always left behind when they do it. But we don't know the exact mechanism of how it works. You and I of course, move using muscles. And the molecules responsible for that in us are actin and myosin. Here's a wild thing. In 1999, some scientists put actin-disrupting compounds in solution with diatoms, and those diatoms lost their ability to move. So while diatom motility remains something of a mystery, these tiny jewel-encrusted algae move using the same molecular systems as us. If you've been looking closely, you might be wondering what these bubbles are. And if you are, we hope we can surprise you. Those are oil droplets, and they store energy for the diatom when they might be having trouble finding light or their usual nutrients. 
these little organisms are so good at creating this fatty oil that scientists have wondered whether we might use diatoms as tiny factories that turn sunlight and carbon dioxide into fuel not just for them, but for our future airplanes. It might be tempting to think of these cells just as little microscopic jewels, just something nice to look at. But they also have a huge impact on our world. Of all of the photosynthesis being done on Earth, around one-fifth is done by diatoms, which puts them on par with all rainforests on Earth combined. And it means that we owe a great deal to these microorganisms, and not just our oxygen. When they die, their silica frustules sink to the bottom of the water that they're in and accumulate into a soft, chalky rock that we know better as diatomaceous earth. That key ingredient in beer and wine filtration, paint, and, of course, cat litter. So yes, these beautiful jewels that the unknown Mr. C spotted in 1703 don't just provide us with every fifth breath we take. They also help make our cat litter more absorbent. And also, they're just really nice to look at. So thank you for coming on this journey with us as we explore the unseen world that surrounds us. If you want to see more from our master of microscopes, James, check out Jam and Germs on Instagram. And if you want to see more from us, there's always a subscribe button somewhere nearby. Life in the microcosmos is tough for its unicellular residents. Prokaryotes and protists have to compete for food and space while also trying to avoid organisms that are more than happy to see all of their complex, energy-filled biological bits as an afternoon snack. And managing those tasks can be even more daunting when you are very very small. So instead of facing all these challenges alone, many of these organisms treat survival as a team effort. As cells divide, they adhere to one another, building a colony that becomes larger and larger with every cell division. An individual cell can only get so big before its size comes at the expense of other abilities. But a colony can get much bigger, providing protection against predators and a competitive advantage when it comes to finding space and food. And as the cells come together and organize, a colony can enable organisms to do so much more than they could on their own. It's an advantage that became a vital step on the path not just to more complexity in the microcosmos, but also a vital step on the path to us. But before we get to that, let's check out this long green thing cutting across the screen. Maybe it looks like a blade of grass rudely floating in everybody's way. But if you look closer, you can see thin filaments made up of individual cells of a freshwater cyanobacteria called a phanazomenon. Oftentimes, the names of these little organisms are really a pain to say, but a phanazomenon is just a joy. If these cells were on their own, they'd basically be little balls of candy just waiting to get chomped, but these long grass-like structures make it harder for filter feeders like water flea to eat the aphanazomenon colony. In lakes and ponds, these grassy structures can accumulate, creating dense, visible blooms that release toxins into the water.
Nostoc colonies are also made up of filaments, like a string of beads, where the beads are cyanobacteria. But where a phanazomenon likes to keep its strands elongated, Nostoc wraps its filaments around a structure made mostly of different types of sugar that it excretes to create a round, gelatinous mass. These colonies vary in size, but some particularly large ones have been measured with a diameter of 22 centimeters. I realize I said that like 22 centimeters is very big, but it is when you're talking about a colony of single-celled organisms. Nostoc use sunlight to make their food, but in the process, they also produce oxygen. This is a problem because Nostoc also likes to fix nitrogen from the air to make necessary chemicals, and oxygen interferes with a key step in that process. But living in a colony means that some of the Nostoc cells can specialize, developing a thicker exterior that prevents oxygen from getting inside the cell. These specialized cells are called heterocysts, and they can focus on fixing nitrogen without any worries of intruding oxygen, while the rest of the colony can continue photosynthesizing. Bacteria aren't the only species that form colonies. These spiked circular creatures are Pseudopediastrum boreanum. The colonies are flat, and the cells are arranged in concentric circles around each other. Where the Aphanazomenon and Nostoc colonies we showed you earlier seem to be full of cells strung together, the Pseudopediastrum colonies are usually made up of eight, 16, or 32 cells, whose walls contain sporopollenin, a hardy material that protects the cells from the environment. The gold algae Cynura also forms colonies, with individual cells coming together like little yellow marigolds. Each cell is encased in silica scales and has two whip-like structures called flagella, which tumble the colony through the water. When Cynuras bloom, they can turn a whole pond yellow, letting off a smell that is somewhat hard to describe, but even if you can't see the pond, you will definitely be able to smell it. This gonium colony is made up of several flagellated cells arranged in a sphere. It may look simpler compared to some of the other colonies we've seen, but with the rest of its vulvacine algae relatives, it may hold answers to how multicellular life evolved. Members of this genus are either unicellular or form colonies that, through evolution, have increased in complexity from species to species, like this Eudorina colony, whose structure is more complex when compared to its predecessors. Like Ghanium, the Eudorina colony is made up of only one type of cell repeated around its surface. But these colonies created the structure that would serve as the evolutionary stepping stone for a species just on the edge of multicellular, Pleodorina, which contains specialized reproductive cells, and then ultimately to the definitely multicellular Volvox algae. Like the colonies before it, Volvox is built around a gooey transparent matrix, and like Pleodorina, it contains a set of specialized reproductive cells, just a tad bit more specialized. Those smaller green spots are somatic cells, or body cells. They don't reproduce or divide, and one of their main jobs is to help move the colony using their flagella. But after a few days, when their duty is done, those cells die. Meanwhile, on the inside are the larger gonidia cells, which drive asexual reproduction and might be immortal. Now remember the Gnostic colonies that we talked about before? They also had elements of specialization, with some cells devoted to nitrogen fixing and others devoted to photosynthesis. The difference between Gnostic and Volvox, however, is that Volvox reproduces by creating multicellular daughters inside of it. 
the gonidia cells divide, creating a kind of baby volvox with all of the somatic cells and gonidia cells it will need as it matures. It's an organism inside an organism, and when they're released, it is not cell division, it is birth. Another example of how when you look very, very close, every sharp line turns out to be blurry. The colonies that assemble in the microcosmos are important, not just for the survival of the organisms that comprise them, but to us and our understanding of how our own multicellular existence came into being. Whether bacteria or algae, the way these colonies come together and the shapes they take on can be as distinctive as the individual organisms they're made of. They make life in the microcosmos just that much more complex, forming the foundations for multicellular life both under the microscope and beyond. Thank you for coming on this journey with us. If you want to see more from our master of microscopes, James, check out Jam and Germs on Instagram. And if you want a new video like this in your subscription box every week, there's got to be a subscribe button somewhere nearby. This round little unicellular creature came to us via a plankton net, a mesh with tiny microscopic holes through which we ran hundreds and hundreds of liters of water, letting us collect anything too large to pass through. We haven't been able to identify this species yet, making it a bit of a mystery. But the bigger mystery is still to come, because this little creature is about to undergo that most universal and unknowable experience of all, death. Death comes to the microcosmos in many forms, like this stentor polymorphus slowly expelling the contents of its once trumpet-like body into the surrounding environment, or this dead larva whose exoskeleton is now an inanimate host to two unicellular organisms. Even the mighty tardigrade, which has survived as a species through multiple mass extinctions, is not immune to death. This is, of course, the natural order of things. Predators hunt and their prey attempt to survive with varying levels of success. This is Loxophyllum meleagris, a large unicellular organism that we've shown before eating a rotifer. This one is practically stuffed with those multicellular creatures. We counted five rotifers inside of it. But sometimes the predator becomes the prey, and even the Loxophyllum meleagris has to find ways to ensure survival when other species come after it. This seemingly unlikely threat is the Lacrimaria olor. Its name in Latin means tears of a swan, a name that suits both its teardrop shape and its neck-like extension, which gets up to eight times longer than its body in search of prey. Sometimes we can see its neck poking out of the dirt on our microscope slide. But even knowing that, you'd be forgiven for thinking that it's unlikely that something so small could pose a problem for those larger loxophyllum. And yet, the lacrimaria manages to take quite a chunk out of the loxophyllum. The loxophyllum, though, survives thanks to its ability to regenerate the piece that was taken, but not all prey get so lucky. Here, this rotifer has been killed 
by a heliozoan, destined to become food, a fate that this flagellate is about to share as it becomes captured by a heliozoan that is in the middle of cell division. The flagellate has been trapped by those long extensions called axopods that radiate out from the heliozoan's body. As the flagellate comes further in, it will be engulfed by the cells into its own food compartment called a vacuole. There, it will be lysed open and its contents digested by the heliozoa. In the end, though, the natural order comes for predators too. Here, another heliozoan's dying cellular body attracts the various decomposers of the microbial world. Aside from predators, there are many other factors that lead a single-celled organism to die. Changes in temperature, oxygen concentration, pH, water quality, so much more. This single-celled organism is swollen because the water surrounding it is entering the cell via osmosis. Many organisms have water pumps called contractile vacuoles that they use to push water back out and prevent that swelling. But as in the case of this organism, sometimes those contractile vacuoles stop working. And when that happens, the cell swells and explodes. Other times, the cause of death is harder to determine, like this paradoleptus that spent several hours swimming before going still, its shape beginning to change until it melts away, seeming to kill not only the paradoleptus, but this small green cell swimming nearby, but leaving other smaller flagellates seemingly unaffected. And this brings us back to the beginning with our mystery organism that is about to undergo a death laden with even more mysteries. At first, the cell looks like it's just melting away, dissolving into something that resembles a microbial Milky Way. Except that for a few seconds, it almost looks like the cell membrane is able to close itself back up. We think though we can't know for sure that some of the mechanisms inside this cell are still working and that the organism is trying to recover. But alas, survival is not in the cards. Its membrane goes through lysis, releasing its insides to the surrounding environment. This death is unlike any other kind of death we have observed under our microscope, and we're still not sure what caused it. Perhaps there were so many organisms in this sample that they depleted the oxygen, and this organism couldn't continue cellular respiration. But perhaps it was something else. Death at every size holds its own mysteries, but it also reveals. The observations we make, even the guesses we come up with, tell us about the way these microbes interact with their environment, the way their bodies work and the connections that exist between them. It is only ever in the mysteries that knowledge is waiting to be found. Thank you for coming on this journey with us as we explore the unseen world that surrounds us. If you want to see more from our master of microscopes, James, check out Jam and Germs on Instagram, where he is constantly posting cool stuff. And if you want to see more from Journey to the Microcosmos here on YouTube, there's always a subscribe button somewhere nearby.